Hey everybody, it's Sam Coper from Forward Observer. Thanks for watching. It's been a while, YouTube. I'm back and I have, I'm gonna do another video this week. This is the week of Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I wanna talk about what happened with this Whiskey Warrior incident over the weekend on Sunday. And I wanna start off with, well, let's start with a, a quick recap. This kid, he's an Iraq veteran. He gets on Instagram and he's saying that police are surrounding his home and they're going to enforce a red flag law against him because he has a 30 round magazine in his home. And there was a huge rush to judgment. And I don't blame people for this generally because we want to assume that this is an Iraq veteran. He's one of us. Red flag laws and gun confiscation, gun confiscation have been in the news a lot. It's out in the zeitgeist and people, especially in the gun rights community, were very, we're very interested in ensuring that no unconstitutional laws are, are brought against anyone, but especially against a fellow veteran. Turns out that it may not have been a red flag law, turned out it may have been domestic violence or some, for some other reasons police were showing up. So this kid got on Instagram, a lot of people shared it, a lot of people lent their support, their encouragement, and then people showed up locally which is what I wanna say, the number one thing, maybe the only thing that went right in this entire scenario is that people showed up. People said, we have a vested interest to protect our own, especially when it comes to gun rights, and they showed up. And I say, if you went out there, let's forget about what it actually turned out into. If you went out there, I think I think you did the right thing. And not, not everyone agrees. I've seen a lot of stuff on, so, uh, especially Instagram, a lot of the bro vets calling those guys out, but you know what? If you if you went out there to help this kid, I say bravo. That's the that is the only thing that went right in this entire this entire scenario. Now let's talk about what went wrong. That's a sustain. People showed up. If that happened to me and I got on Instagram or Facebook and was live streaming this stuff, yeah, I would want people to show up. I would want people to show up and help me out and make sure that police don't murder me for a freaking magazine all right let's get to the improved specifically on the intelligence side i'm not going to discuss a lot of stuff beyond some intelligence lessons learned here number one improve information matters a lot of people figured out that being that verifying and, and analyzing incoming information is a lot more difficult than it seems and welcome to the world of intelligence because you have this kid out there he gets on instagram and we want to believe him we want to give him the benefit of the doubt if there, even if maybe there was no doubt and we want to go and help him. And it turns out that the, he mischaracterized the situation or apparently mischaracterized the situation. Guys, that's called single source information. Okay. That's one guy reporting one thing. And now we have to make a decision. Do we stay or do we go? Let's say that that happened a mile and a half from where you live. Do I stay or do I go? You don't know this guy, which brings up another point in just a second, but you don't know this guy. You don't know if it's true. We want to give him the benefit of the doubt. So we go and we show up. By the way, I left, I'm out of town. I left my microphone at home. So I hope the audio is not too bad. So lesson learned number one is understand what single source information is and be aware that in an SHTF without rule of law, boogaloo, whatever situation, you may have to make a decision based on single source information, which is inherently vulnerable. It's an inherently risky thing to do because there's no way to confirm or deny single source information. There's one guy saying something and no one else out there exists to corroborate it, at least as far as we knew. So this guy gets on social media and now everybody, I saw this, I was on the roads on Sunday night, Sunday evening, just scrolling through Instagram and and looking at all these people sharing updates, and I got on Facebook, everyone was sharing it, and they were sharing these updates, and I heard this, and oh, this is what's coming up over the police scanner and all this stuff. By the way, I think, I think even though that ended up being uh, some, some misinformation or some misunderstood information, I applaud local guys for turning on the police scanner and listening in. It didn't, it didn't hurt anything just to be listening. Typically, a lot of that stuff, especially when the SWAT's called out, is gonna be on their tech channels, which are gonna be encrypted. You're not gonna have access to that unless you're you're z zoned in to local police operations somehow. 
So actually, I guess probably that's the second thing is sustain is turn on the police scanner and start to consume more information. So number one improve is don't act, uh, be aware of single source information that it's inherently risky. Number two, people started sharing a bunch of stuff on Facebook. And now we get into this thing called firsthand or secondhand information or third hand, fifth hand information because I saw stuff on Facebook and people were like, yeah, a buddy, a friend, a friend's in law enforcement and he told his buddy who's my buddy and he, now he told me, all right. So this is an indirect source. Now we're, we're doubt, now dealing with telling us this information. So who are the direct sources in this instance? Well, the direct source was Whiskey, uh, Whiskey Warrior 556. A direct source was law enforcement. I'm not talking about the quality of the information or the accuracy of the information they put out, but th those two people were a direct source, those two sources. And then we had some observers on scene who I believe were live streaming this event. That's a direct source. Now on the other side of that, now we have indirect sources where people are getting this second, third, fourth, fifth hand on down the line and now putting stuff that they believe to be true. They live in, in BFE, Nevada or wherever. And now they're showing, they're talking about stuff that's going on in New York. So as a consumer of information, let's say, I don't know, as an intelligence analyst, we're trying to make, we're trying to make sense of all this information. That's the second thing I'm going to look at is this por this person is reporting information. How did they get it? Is it a direct or indirect source? So probably lesson learned number two is let's be a little more judicious about not just trying to understand the information that a source is reporting, but also understanding where the source is getting that information, how the source has access, direct access or indirect access to this information. Number three is you know, a lot of this stuff, I, there's been YouTube videos and Facebook posts and 20 million, six gorillion uh, Twitter shares and all this stuff about, about what was happening. And a lot of it was just absolutely wrong information. I would encourage folks, I always say 60, 30, 10, 60, 30, 10 split of the time that you dedicate of the information you consume, especially when it comes to news, 60% of your news should be local in my opinion, because in a without rule of law, SHTF, grid down, boogaloo, whatever, stuff that's going on in New York, if you live in Texas, stuff that goes on in New York has zero value for you or California or wherever. So 60% of the information you consume should come locally. 30% should be at the state, maybe region level, like counties next door up to the state level. And then 10% should be the national level. Because one thing I try to explain to people when I get the chance is, you know, if you're preparing for an EMP or you're preparing for, yeah, let's say EMP or economic collapse or whatever, you're not actually preparing for an economic collapse. You're preparing for the follow on effects of economic collapse. And it doesn't matter what causes the event necessarily. It doesn't matter what's happening nationally. What matters is how your, your street or how your subdivision or how your neighborhood is going to be impacted. And if we don't understand those follow on effects, then it doesn't matter how well you understand the national situation, especially if the power's off, especially if there's a bank holiday or there's some kind of systems disruption and food, water, power, whatever is disrupted. You're not gonna, your, fo your main focus is gonna be on what's happening on your street, in your neighborhood and how your group is going to react. So 60, 30, 10, that, I think that's pretty solid advice. That kind of brings up another point, you know, if this, there's some level of security here for a lot of, for 99% of people involved in this online, because there's absolutely no direct threat to them. 99% of people involved in, in sharing information had zero impact, had zero ability to influence the situation there. And really, I think time better spent is thinking about what, what you are going to do locally if this happens in your neck of the woods. So my kind of next improve is, or kind of lesson, not, not really improve, but my next lesson learned is, guys, you, you have to turn your preparedness group into an intelligence network. Because the only, the only way we solve the problem of single source information is having multiple sources report on the same event.
And there's a lot of value in that because everyone has their slice of the pie, right? And, and in your ACE, your analysis and control element in your, your intelligence cell or whatever you might have of your community security team or preparedness group or whatever, you want that nuanced information coming in because it helps you to have a more complete view of the situation. You don't have just one guy telling you something. You have maybe multiple people telling you something and maybe you glean something else from that. It's called redundancy. It's sometimes it's sometimes it can be overwhelming, but I think in this situation having a couple of different people who I know and trust reporting on this stuff and I have I have reasonable expectations that what they're telling me is accurate to the best of their knowledge is helpful. So turn your prepper group into an intelligence network. What's going to happen is someone in your prepper group or someone in your neighborhood watch group or whatever, they're going to see something that has intelligence value to you in the group. But if they don't understand intelligence value, they're not sharing that information. And if they're not sharing that information, we have a collection gap for that individual in that place at that time. Maybe we have an enduring collection gap because this guy doesn't understand intelligence and this guy doesn't understand intelligence value. And he doesn't know that what he's observing should be reported up through a phone call, a text message, ham radio, encrypted email, sending you uh, sending you pictures or video of the situation or whatever. You have to turn your prepper group into an intelligence network. You have to do that because information matters. We just saw it. We just saw it in this last situation here in New, or in New, in New, up there in New York with Whiskey Warrior. Information matters. Information has to be timely, accurate, relevant, specific, and predictive or actionable. The intelligence has to be predictive or actionable. If we want the best, if we if we want to have the, the best chances for a positive for an outcome that's positive, beneficial to us. And that leads me to my next point, which is about developing trust networks. Because in my own local group, what I want to be able to do is get a phone call or a text message or something, or a message on Signal or Telegram or whatever from John. And I know, like, and trust John. And I know that if John is telling me this information, then, and he says he has first hand access, he's watching it now, then I know that is happening right now. I'm not getting it from some stranger on Twitter or Facebook. It's not being shared from someone who lives two miles or five miles away from me, and I have no clue who these guys are. Once we start sharing information and start building trust, once people understand intelligence value, and once people understand how to help drive the mission by reporting information of intelligence value, guys, that's a game changer. I mean, we just saw this past weekend how many bad things can happen when we act on bad information. How much time, resources, maybe, maybe, how, maybe we're talking about livelihoods that are lost because of bad information. So I hope everyone kind of looks at this. I think, I think a lot of people now are, you know, in the past couple of days, are kind of taking a step back and saying, well, this, you know, this could have been better. This information was bad. We acted here and maybe we shouldn't have because we pulled the trigger too early because we didn't yet understand what was going on. And look, that's going to happen in conflict. That's a level of uncertainty. There's always going to be some uncertainty because we can't know everything. But if we turn our prepper groups into intelligence networks of these people sharing things, sharing information up so that we can have a better understanding of our own security situation or a better understanding of the local picture during this SHTF without rule of law event, whatever is happening, we're going to be in a much better position to have beneficial outcomes, outcomes beneficial for us. So those were some of my observations. If you have observations related to intelligence, please let me know in the comments. If you have your own input, I'd be interested to read that stuff. Let's keep this, let's keep kind of the operation stuff out. And, and really just focus on the intel picture, on the intel side, because that's what I'm here to do, is, is help where I can teach some of these principles of intelligence gathering and intelligence analysis, provide some real world experiences. And man, we gotta get people coached up on intel, because we're, you know, people are talking about a lot of things, especially in a conflict, 
that cannot be won without intelligence. And frankly, right now, other players in this area have much better intelligence, uh, much better intelligence capabilities than we do. And we probably don't have a lot of time to catch up, but we need to be catching up as quickly as possible. So I'd honestly encourage you, you know, if you're not a super huge gun guy, maybe you're old and broke and you're trying to figure out where you can help out, go learn about intelligence. Go to my website, forwardobserver.com. I got a bunch of blog posts there about how to do this stuff locally from a community security perspective, like a prepper group or a community a neighbor, neighborhood watch or something like that. Go read up on the website. Uh, also this week, this is not, I didn't intend to do a sales pitch, but this week uh, is the first time I've ever done anything for Black Friday or Cyber Monday, but I've got a course called the Area Intelligence Course. It's available for 50% off. If you just go to forwardobserver.com slash Black Friday, forwardobserver.com slash Black Friday, you'll be able to see that, uh, kind of get a, an understanding of what's in that course. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I'll be back very soon, May, maybe actually later this afternoon with another video on what I was talking about in the last video, which is SHTF concepts. I'm going through some manuals, picking some stuff out and talking about the value of intelligence and why you cannot win anything without intelligence. Go back and read all about the American Revolution. They could not have done it without intelligence. It is an incredible utility in any kind of conflict. We have to know what's going on once we understand what's going on, we can make better decisions. Not just better decisions, but we can make better decisions faster. Especially if our OODA loop is cycling faster than our adversary's OODA loop. We're making better decisions faster, reduce, re, are, uh, reducing uncertainty about the future, and it's going to lead to more positive outcomes for us. So that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay out front.